Let's start today with three different cases of infants who presented with inborn errors in metabolism. We may or may not have taken care of these babies. Case one is a healthy, full-term male born with no risk factors by vaginal delivery with good APGARs who had been in couplet care with his mother. He was now 27 hours old and he'd already had the discharge paperwork signed, but he was still waiting for his hearing screen. Per the mother's report, the mother went to the baby to feed the baby in the crib, but the baby was completely gray and not moving at all. So the mother pulled the code button and the NICU team came rushing in. They rushed the baby back to the NICU after kind of initial PPV and everything. And they intubate the baby, give epi, lines, IV fluids, the whole nine yards, and they're able to bring the baby back. And nobody was really sure what had happened. The mother kept saying the baby wouldn't wake up but nobody was really sure if the mother had accidentally fallen asleep with the baby, which as you all know, happens unfortunately a lot in couplet care, not a lot. Thankfully, the baby made a full recovery, including a completely normal MRI. Before discharge, the baby is diagnosed as having a very long chain fatty acid oxygenation disorder, a type of inborn error of metabolism. Okay, case two. This was a beautiful baby girl delivered at 39 weeks by repeat C-section. She had a little bit of tachypnea at birth, which everybody assumed, probably correctly, was a little bit of TTN. This resolved, but then the baby had really poor feedings. The baby was barely latching, and then even when she did, she barely sucked out a few drops. The baby's sugars were kind of borderline, and she was given a glucose gel in newborn nursery. With continued low sugars, and the baby was just kind of becoming a little bit sleepier, the baby was admitted to the NICU. As the little girl was being admitted to the NICU, her heart rate fell to the 60s and she became completely apneic. She was intubated and started on aggressive IV fluids, and her labs came back and showed not only a profound metabolic acidosis, but also a very high ammonia level. Then, under the guidance of a metabolic specialist, the ammonia level eventually stabilized and the infant was eventually diagnosed with an organic acidemia, specifically propionic acidemia. Okay, case three. The third case is an X 37 week baby who had already been discharged home and presented to the ER at five days of life. The parents brought him back in because he seemed to be really sleepy and vomiting even tiny amounts of feeds that he was taking. When he got to the ER, he was 12% below his birth weight and indeed extremely sleepy. In fact, the baby was lethargic and hypotonic the routine blood tests were done and then the baby was shipped off to a children's hospital. Shortly after admission to the children's hospital, the baby began posturing and then having seizures. Blood work showed profound metabolic acidosis and despite very aggressive resuscitation, this baby ended up passing away at the children's hospital. The diagnosis was later made as maple syrup urine disease. So what can we say about all these presentations? Well, for a start, they all occurred very suddenly and they all occurred in previously pretty healthy appearing newborns. And they all happened within a few days of life. Obviously not all metabolic disorders present in the first few days of life, but these three did. And they all kind of mimicked something else, maybe some sort of respiratory event or a really bad sepsis or a ductal dependent cardiac disease or adrenal crisis or something. So nobody immediately would be thinking, oh, this is classic inborn error of metabolism. The thing about inborn errors of metabolism, also shortened to IEM, is that they are unbelievably confusing. They can present at completely different times. Some cases don't really present or aren't at least diagnosed until adulthood. And the actual disorders involve a million different enzymes, maybe thousands of different enzymes and pathways. I definitely don't know the different steps of the metabolic pathways and I'm gonna admit this now, I didn't even study them for my neonatal or pediatric boards. I was kind of fine if the exam was just being marked out of 
But the really important thing with inborn errors in metabolism is that you are aware of them, that you're thinking about them, and that you know how to actually test for them initially. And obviously you have some sort of idea how to initially stabilize them. Ultimately, the real treatment is going to be done under the guidance of a metabolic specialist, but you have to stabilize those babies first, and you can't do that unless you've actually made the diagnosis. For the next two videos, we're going to go over some really important points of IEM, but for now, we have three take-home points that we would like you to learn from these videos. Number one, always consider an inborn error of metabolism. They are much more common than you would think. So any baby who suddenly gets sick in kind of like a weird way or is slowly deteriorating and you don't have a good reason. For example, a baby that looks like it's septic but has like zero sepsis risk factors or like the sudden development of really weird neurological symptoms in a previously healthy baby. If you don't consider IEM, then you will miss it. Number two, know which labs to get. If you are considering an inborn error of metabolism, then definitely you want to check for acidosis. So get a gas. Also, you want to check for hypoglycemia. So check a glucose level. And also you're worried about a high level of ammonia. So check an ammonia level. Obviously, there are lots of really specialized labs depending on what disease process there is. And there are other generalized labs you might want to get. So a lot of times these babies look like they might have sepsis you're probably getting a CBC anyway. Some of the organic acidemias can also have thrombocytopenia and neutropenia. It would be nice to have a BMP to kind of see whether it's an elevated anion gap or not. But essentially start with a gas, a sugar, and an ammonia level. And number three is that you should know the first steps of treatment. The most important thing that you should do is make the baby NPO and stop giving the baby any extra protein through the IV fluids. You don't know if the inborn error of metabolism is the baby's inability to break down protein. So just make the baby NPO and then start the baby on very aggressive fluid resuscitation with just D10. So kind of about 150 mLs per kilo per day of just D10. Obviously, you're also supporting the babies in every other way, but those are the two most important things that you need to do initially. Well, those are the essential pieces of information you need to know about IEM. I'm Dr. Tala, and this is Tala Talks NICU. So please like this video if you got this far and subscribe to this channel if you want to hear loads more about neonatal education. If you'd like to hear a little bit more about inborn errors of metabolism, then please stick around.